Tintin in America is the third adventure of the world's favourite Belgian, written and illustrated by Hergé. It was published weekly from September 1931 to October 1932. Then, 13 years later, the comic was redrawn and colourised by its creator. In 1992, it was the last Tintin story to be adapted for television. Incidentally, the two adventures that came before it were not touched for TV. Georges Remé, aka Hergé, felt that the land of the Soviets was best ignored, hence why it is the only early album he never redrew. And Tintin in the Congo, due to its racial insensitivity towards tribal Africans, and the young reporter's animal kill count. The adaptation of Tintin in America suffers from being one of the three episodes in this TV series that was not given 45 minutes to tell its story. I have no idea if there was a legitimate reason why these three were only given 22 minutes. The only clue with this one could be the decision to remove the sequence involving Native Americans. Even having the honour of being featured on the comic's cover couldn't save the feather-headed chief. Anyway, how faithful was this adaptation? Let's see if we can spot the differences. Tintin arrives in Chicago to investigate the city's gangster problems, and is immediately kidnapped by a taxi driver. He uses a penknife to cut through the bottom of the cab, which may sound silly, but not when you consider the original version, where he escaped using a saw that he had in his suitcase. Police! Pull over! The taxi's run into trouble. Send the Australian and arrange for a special car. Before he can spill the beans on who hired him, the cabbie is knocked out by Captain Boomerang. Boomerang gets away when a fellow gang member deliberately crashes his car into the cops, sending Tintin flying. Luckily, nobody is hurt, but in the comic, Tintin is taken away to the hospital. After the taxi incident, Tintin is almost killed courtesy of real-life mobster Al Capone, but Snowy and the reporter's unique brand of luck saves him. Leaving the criminals tied up, he tries to get a cop to help him, but the officer thinks the young man must be crazy. During this, Capone and his men escape, and the King of Chicago plays no further part in the adventure. Rather than go through all that again, what do you say? Fine. In the episode, Al Capone is the main villain of the story, although he is never named, and Bobby Smiles, who tries to bribe Tintin into leaving the city, works for him. In the comic, Smiles is the head of a rival gang, and offers Tintin the money to help him overthrow Capone. Trust me, everything's under control. It better be, or you're next, see? Where did you get that moustache from? Argos. The sequence of Tintin climbing out the window and scaling along the building is a lot more intense in the episode, as while crossing the narrow ledges, he almost falls to his death. When the men claiming to be detectives turn up and take Tintin to his first meeting with Bobby Smiles, the location, said to be a police station, is a warehouse, which naturally makes him suspicious. These sure don't look like policemen to me, Snowy. In the comic, even though the building they take him to is a legitimate-looking office, Tintin still suspects he is in danger. I don't like bribes or threats, Mr. Smiles. I'll leave Chicago when I'm ready, after I'm finished my story. The mob attempts to kill the reporter by gassing him and throwing his unconscious body in the sea. But they use the wrong sort of gas, thus the water revives our hero. In the episode, it is Snowy who saves Tintin by fishing him up to the surface. Hey guys, know how you call the police without a phone? Well... <laughs> 
The mobster hires an assassin to fill the young man and his dog with bullets. This was the cue for the advert break, as indicated by the dramatic fade-out. However, while the episode may have been at 50%, at this point in the comic, we are only at 20%. Kids stuff. Bobby Smiles is informed that the Coconut Mob have received a shipment of whiskey, which Smiles intends to steal. In the episode, it is not said if the delivery is being handled by a rival gang, but the contents of the truck was changed to the far more drier Treasury Bills. Now, what kind of a person would do a thing like that? <laughs> this turns out to be an ambush arranged by Tintin, but Smiles still manages to easily escape. A very minor difference is that the truck driver, an undercover cop, was given a pencil-thin moustache in the adaptation. Don't worry, Chief, I'll find him. You just get a jail cell ready. Tintin tracks down the blue-suited villain to Redskin City, located near an Indian reservation. The name of the town in the episode was changed, understandably, to Red Dog City, and is said, instead, to be located near some mountains, which it is, and no Native Americans are seen or mentioned. Uh, I got just the one for you. Her name's Beatrice. Hello, Beatrice. Ah. <gasps> uh. I don't think Beatrice likes me very much. Tintin's adventure in What Remains of the Wild West takes up 27 pages, almost half of the comic's content. Disappointingly, only three were used for this adaptation, taking up less than three minutes of its runtime, meaning it was hardly worth the young man buying himself more suitable attire. Items cut include Bobby Smiles convincing a tribe of Redskins to get rid of Tintin, discovering oil in the process. Tintin rides on a runaway train until it collides with some dynamite. Tintin is framed by a Mexican bandit and almost hanged, and almost rescued by an alcoholic sheriff. And finally, after narrowly escaping a prairie fire, he gets the old tied to the railway lines treatment. Ready? Okay. However, the outcome is still the same. Tintin arrests Bobby Smiles. Though in the adaptation, he does so without firing a shot. Huh? Sorry to disappoint you, Mr. Smiles. Let's go, the police are waiting. Upon returning to Chicago, Snowy is kidnapped, and Detective Mike McAdam insists he's the man for the case. But while he may be confident, he certainly isn't competent. Tintin infiltrates the hideout of the unnamed Al Capone by getting a boy and his baseball to distract the doorman. In the comic, it is Bugsy's hideout who he sneaks into, although we do not see how he gets in. Kid, you want to earn ten bucks? Armoured from within a suit of armour, Tintin frees Snowy from the locked cell by taking the keys from the ball-headed Bugsy, who was not given a name in the original story. Once opened, he finds that Snowy has been chained to the wall. In the episode, Tintin uses a sword to break the door's padlock, and once he does, Snowy happily hops out, showing that he wasn't chained up. Huh? Hey, what's going on? Our hero tricks Bugsy's boys the same way in both sources, by switching the names of the cell doors. The minor change is that in the episode, the dungeon sign is a skull and crossbones, and the main difference is that instead of being a dungeon that apparently goes up rather than down, the cell has no floor. What it does have is a high drop to a pit full of water. Here is where Tintin defeats Bugsy, with help from Snowy. But in the comic, their sword fight does not happen until a few pages later when instead of a suit of steel and a sword, Tintin is armed with an empty gun and a bellboy outfit. The 
episode ends once Tintin leads the police to Capone, but in the comic, Bugsy is still at large. He arranges for a man, who does get a name, namely Maurice, to lure Tintin to his death via a meat grinder, but fortunately, at that same moment, the workers at the factory go on strike. After this, another mobster, wearing another green suit, has the reporter kidnapped, then tied to a dumbbell with the aim of drowning him in Lake Michigan. Luckily, the weights belong to a phony weightlifter, which apparently none of the men who acquired the supposed 400 pound weights or dropped Tintin into the water noticed. Just when the young man thinks he has been saved, his rescuers turn out to be pirate mobsters, who he and Snowy defeat immediately. The comic concludes with our heroes on their way back to Europe. The episode ends with Tintin typing out his report, a rather fitting way to end the TV series, as this is the only time he is seen doing stage two of his job. Come on, Snowy, here we go again! 